I am not as tall as Derek, wow. Okay, <laughs> um, so just a quick introduction for the program this evening. Um, our wonderful guest, Derek Green, is an American musician, best known as the vocalist for the Brazilian heavy metal band Sepultura. He auditioned for the band in 1998 and has toured the world with Sepultura traveling to 81 different countries. And this is where his passion for photography was sparked um, as a result of encountering different places and experiencing new cultures. And so tonight, Derek is going to take us on a journey through um, some of the places that he's visited through his images. So thanks so much for being here. Hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wake everybody up now. Um, so yes, um, I'm Derek Green. I was born here in Cleveland. I see a lot of faces that I recognize here, so this should be a lot of fun. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a background of where I came from and what got me into taking photos. And from traveling, it was something that I always wanted to do. And it started at a very young age. So. What made me want to do kind of a slideshow and talk through it was growing up, my father did a lot of traveling, and he was in the military. He was actually in the Korean War, which is hard to believe <laughs> nowadays, because I don't talk to many people that know anything about what was going on then. But the interesting thing is that he always enjoyed photography, and he always took pictures. And a lot of the times, they're very innocently taken pictures because he didn't know too much of what was going on with the politics that was happening in Korea. But every Sunday, he would come with the entire slideshow and make us watch. And I enjoyed this after having dinner, Sunday dinner, and then watching the slideshows and having relatives come over and him talking through the photos and everyone asking questions about the photos. So this kind of stuck in my mind of something that I would like to do, I guess, with this, when Renee asked me to be a part of the show. And it felt very home, you know, being at home, that connection with my father and my family. And I wanted to do the same thing. So um, the whole thing about me getting in this band, Sepultura, um, it really started from playing in my parents' basement, like everything kind of leads into a line, so that's why I'm kind of giving you the backstory, if you don't know. So starting with playing in the bands, starting playing in my parents' basement, very loud, <laughs> destroying my neighbor's ears and my eardrums as well. Then deciding that I wanted to move to New York with a friend and start the band, a different band there. Once in New York, it was kind of crazy, just working and staying around that world of music. And I had no expectations as far as what was gonna happen, but the opportunity came about from a record person who had seen my bands play pre uh, previously and felt that I could be in this band Sepultura who had lost their singer who left the band. Now this band Sepultura I, didn't, I knew of, but I didn't realize how big the band was because there wasn't the internet at the time. So in my own, in my mind, I was like, okay, I, I, I got a cassette tape of this band. I'm gonna check it out and, and see what's going on. I, I know some of these songs, it's a lot heavier from what I'm used to, but you know, these guys are professional and I wanna be in that position of playing with professional people. So once I got a, a cassette tape that they sent me and they were, you could do anything on the tape they had one song, and you could do your vocals, your lyrics, whatever, over their music, new music that they wrote. So I got that tape, went to the studio in New York, did my version of it, and sent it to them. And keep in mind, I, I'd never been to Brazil. I didn't know any Brazilians. I never knew that they spoke Portuguese in Brazil. I knew nothing about the country, and I had to go to the library with my library card because the internet wasn't really there yet. <laughs> and I got all these books out about South America, about Brazil and everything. So once I heard back from them, they're like, yes, come down for a test, come to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and do a test. 
for two weeks. So I was expecting, okay, in a month I'll go down, I'll be ready to do this. And they were like, no, next week. We'll send a ticket for you, come down, we're doing this right away. So it was kind of crazy. I decided to get on the plane, go there. I never met them. Stayed there for two weeks. The first week I went to football games, to the beach, hung out with their family, stayed in each person's house so they could get to know who I was and their family as well, because it was all part of the band and the tradition there. But once I started walking around with them the time that I was there, I realized that they were extremely popular in a sense that everyone knew who they were, and I, I didn't realize they were that famous because I felt, oh, this is a metal band. There's only going to be certain people that know this band. But it was everyone. I mean, everywhere we went, people were yelling at them or screaming or wanting autographs at the time. There were no cell phone cameras. So it was a lot of signing. So this was kind of shocking. It kind of threw me back like, wow, okay, this is not what I was expecting, but uh, let's do this. And I started to get a little bit nervous and we started and it was really bad. Um, it was really bad. <laughs> and so it just felt really uncomfortable to play with people I'd never met before and they had been so established. I mean, they were already playing massive shows everywhere around the world. So I had a talk with them, and we started doing some cover songs. And the one band that united us was this band called Bad Brains. And there's a band that I saw here in Cleveland, and it started, you know, it brought me back in time again. Like, yes, I love this band. It had a big influence on me. And it was also the first band that I, I saw that had all black guys, you know, playing punk, hardcore, and reggae music. And I thought this was so cool, this whole scene. And... It made it very comfortable for me to, to relate to them and then have that connection. So I came back to New York, and then about a month later, I heard from them. They're like, hey, you want to come back to Brazil and start recording? And I left the US, and I didn't come back for 20 years. That was I moved from New York, and then I just left. And that's when I really got into this uh, view of the world that I had never seen. And I started to realize this band was much bigger than I could possibly imagine. Because we ended up going to places I, I, I never thought that metal even existed, and let alone people knew what was going on. And again, without the internet, there was no way to really know this except for physically being there and being in those places. So this was fascinating to me to see the love that this band had built up, like the fan base that they had, um, coming from Brazil, all the preconceptions that people had, you know, it was, it was intense, you know, taking all this in. But at the same time, I had the chance to go to, to all these wonderful places, and I really wanted to track everything that was happening, but it was so fast. So a lot of the photos and everything came about because I wanted to capture some of those moments, and, and I wanted to capture in a way that was very natural. So I wasn't asking people to pose or anything like that. I knew nothing... I didn't know that much about photography, but I knew what I liked and what I see, and it you know, really stirred something in me. So that was my beginning of wanting to take photos, and it happened because of being with this band and being able to go to so many incredible places. I was able to witness and be a part of certain cultures and languages and everything, so I wanted to document a lot of that, and so I just wanted to make it clear a lot of the times I'm I'm in motion, so a lot of the pictures look like they may have been posed or something, but it's literally like seconds. So I always felt this was very interesting, and I wanted to share this with you know a lot of people that have questions like, what are you doing on tour? What goes on? And so a lot of the times, you know, you're playing a show. It's maybe two hours or an hour and a half long, and you have the rest of the day open unless you're traveling. So a lot of the photos are from just in motion, train, plane, boats, everything. So we're gonna start in Sao Paulo because that was the place I spent most of my time. Again, I was there for 20 years and I just moved back to the US probably four years ago, two of those years in a pandemic. So in the other two years, still touring a lot. So a lot has changed here, especially in Cleveland and uh, especially in the US with politics and everything. But I think this will be a lot of fun to go through this, and we're going to start in Sao Paulo. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to South America, but Brazil is very different compared to the rest of the, 
the other countries that are in South America, just for the fact that they speak Portuguese, and they don't really consider themselves Latino in a sense. And I say that because I talked to a lot of Brazilians and they didn't feel that as well. And, it, and it's a very interesting place, but I didn't know anything really that much about it except for what I read about it. And I didn't realize the, how massive it is. So this is flying into Sao Paulo and they have an airport in the city where you fly in between these buildings to land, which is insane. And, and I, I, it kind of like lost my mind flying in. I was like, is this really happening? And, and this is gonna happen? And so this is the view that I had a lot of times flying in and it's a, a concrete jungle. It's over 20,000 or 20 million people living there in Sao Paulo. It's more than the population of Australia in one city and it's intense. So this was something that was shocking to me that I had no idea about. Um, I mean, it's, it was massive and, and just so much going on. They have a lot of helicopter um, movement that goes on there as far as even they, they had an Uber helicopter where that was something you could find on an app where you could fly for $400 and take you to where you needed to go because there's just so much going on with people making money and, and a wide diversity of people there. So this was something that was shocking I had no idea about. Um, I ended up renting a house in Sao Paulo and this was on my street in Sao Paulo. And it was kind of the view that I had where very beautiful weather in the day and then at certain times at five o'clock in the afternoon pouring down like tropical storm rain for maybe an hour or half an hour and then back to beauty again. So it was always these rainbows that I would see off and on. It was incredible. And uh, everyone told me, don't rent a house. It's extremely dangerous. You'll get robbed. Don't do it. And of course, I rented a house. <laughs> so walking around the city, there's a lot of like different things that they throw in that just catch my eye. And people just take it as normal there as far as lunchtime in Sao Paulo. They'll have certain structures that are set up with a lot of artists, incredible artists that are there. And so there's a lot of graffiti, there's a lot of structures that are there that are incredible that really make the city very unique. But then you also have the city that are against a lot of the graffiti work, which is incredible because they just rather have it gray. And they don't realize that a lot of these artists are working outside of Brazil doing incredible work all over the world and people are paying them a lot of money to actually do this. So it was always fascinating that there was incredible structures all throughout Sao Paulo. This is actually a, a good view of where we would have our studio. Like I've come out of the studio and this is what I would see all the time. These planes coming so close to the building and I always felt like it's gonna happen today. Like something's gonna, I was like, I know. But this building was really interesting. That, I mean, I, I won't go into complete detail, but it was a crazy guy who'd, who had uh, it's a whorehouse and he decided that he wanted to build a hotel connected to it. So he created this huge hotel that never opened up <laughs> and it's still there empty. And all the time, these planes fly like it's going to crash right into it. So that was always something that was very bizarre. And I was like, many questions <laughs> coming to Brazil. Every day, questions. Like, so it's still there. Um, I wasn't really into taking photos of people there because people are very aware of themselves in Brazil. It's, it's a country that's based on a lot of beauty and things like that. So... I wasn't really into taking pictures of people in the very beginning, but every now and then I would find people that weren't really paying attention or posing and, um, and just street people, people who were living either on the street or just walking the street. And uh, I, I don't know, I mean, for me, it was always interesting to find people in their natural element doing nothing, but I mean, I don't know, with her, I definitely felt that there was a story to be told, like she could have been a dancer or something. I don't know, she was in a very elegant way and there was something beautiful about it, but also sad at the same time. And that was this diversity I kept seeing in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. Like so much beauty and at the same time, so much tragedy going on. 
So on the beauty side, I, I, <laughs> I started, I, I got a present from a, a Brazilian there and it was a plastic camera. So I started to get into film. And I, the photos I was taking before digital camera and digital cameras had just started to really come about. But with film, I was really fascinated with this camera. It was a cheap camera, a uh, Holga camera. And it has like a flash, like, and so I had this crazy flash. And so I started to take that around and started to take photos. And the whole idea of like samba and everything is huge in Brazil. But this was interesting because this was at a show that we were playing with a, a band called Jane's Addiction. And they felt that they wanted to have these women come on stage and dance while they were doing their, their song. Um, so I was really just like practicing, getting used to using a film camera. And I thought it was really interesting that there's such a mix of diversity of people there where you can have a rock show, you could have samba, you could do these mixtures and people are really open to it. So it's just like at the moment they were getting ready to go on stage and I was just like, hey, look over here. And they're like, oh. And I just felt so happy with this, especially with the film camera because usually people are moving and it's blurry, but this photo I, I really love because it's just, uh, I wasn't expecting it to happen at all. So, in Brazil, there was, especially in Sao Paulo, there was a lot of different people that I was meeting all the time. And people knew I was in the band, so I had to start from scratch to make my own friends. There were certain people that'd be like, oh, you're in this band, I wanna show you off to my friends. It felt like I was in high school again, even though I was in my late 20s, almost 30 when I joined the band. So I wanted to go out and meet my own friends and, and make friends with people who would, knew nothing about metal music or music in general. So I ended up making friends with the, these people who are like lawyers or um, doctors or just completely off the grid of what I was doing. And they always had these weird events or parties or something going on. And there was an artist that decided that he wanted to create this tank that people would come home to relax in. And this was it. Like you climb into it and you relax for, I don't know, 15, 10 minutes. And I was like, are you serious? I was like, this looks terrifying. There's no, I was completely the opposite. And then I was just talking him through it. I was like, so you spent a ridiculous amount of money to, to have this feeling be soothing to you? And I just didn't understand. And he was just like, yes, yes, it's exactly it. It's exactly what I'm going for. And you, do you know people that want to buy this? I was like, no. It's like, this is, I was like, not at all. This is not something I would ever want in my house unless I was trying to hurt somebody. And this is, so this is a friend of mine. Actually, I became really good friends with him and his family. Um, Eduardo, he's like a very big lawyer in Brazil and he's up for adventure all the time. I think it's just like he wants to show like, yes, I'm ready for anything, anytime, let's do it. And, and his wife is from Scotland and uh, they're an interesting couple. But this was kind of like this weird scene that I was kind of, floating in and out of, of musicians, and then being invited to things like this. <laughs> so you have the other side of Brazil, which was in your face. And this is what I kept asking people about. I was like, look, there's a lot of like people on the street, like what's going on here? And I always kept hearing, it's economic. It's economics, it's all about money, it's, you know? And I was like, yeah, but I think it has to do a lot with race too, because it seems pretty racist. And they were just like, no, 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 no. Brazil is, it's not racist at all. It, it's, it's just, it's very complicated with, uh, with the money, you know. There's poor and then there's rich. But I don't, I think when you live in a place for such a long time, it's hard to see certain things. And I know from living in the U.S. and living outside of the country, I see a lot of, I see the country differently. So I think it was hard for Brazilians to see that until I pointed out certain things. So I started to take a lot of photos of, things that I was seeing of poverty, of things that were really happening that people may skip over. So this, was, this is something that I would see like every day, but I just thought it was interesting that if all the places, like why there, you know, at that moment. So it's just in passing that I saw this and I had to explain to a lot of the people there as I went to a lot of different schools and, um, and universities and I was like, see, this is weird to me that there aren't any black people here, there aren't any black doctors or lawyers that I would see. And I had to explain it to them in that way and they're like, you're right, you're actually, 
you're right. But that was, you know, there's certain people that I was talking to that were kind of living in a bubble. And that exists there, a very small bubble of very rich people or privileged people. But again, there's a larger population that I hadn't met yet because I was still in the world of like, oh, you're in this band, you're only, we're gonna only show you the good stuff. So this was something that was always there and, and in my face that I felt that was something that was hard to ignore. Um, again, there was also like a lot of different events and different things happening. And so again, this is another extreme. Like I would see stuff on the street and then be invited to like Sao Paulo Fashion Week. So this is what was going on there. And I happened to be there and I was, I never go to events like this, but I just thought it would make a cool picture because they look like aliens in a way. <laughs> so, or some, I don't know, some type of abduction that was happening, but it's actually Sao Paulo Fashion Week. And again, this is again Sao Paulo Fashion Week with the flip flops. And so Havaianas are like everywhere internationally all over the world. And I didn't realize it was Brazilian. <laughs> and so I think it's one of the biggest companies that make these flip flops and they're everywhere. And now they're super expensive, <laughs> even though, and, and which is hard for them to believe because you could buy this in any store there for nothing, not anymore. So I started to learn about the diversity in different cities in, in Sao Paulo. And Sao Paulo is a, a, a big business city. And they have uh, basically the way that they speak there. I had to learn Portuguese because I was living alone. And this was something that was very difficult because a lot of the guys in my band, they have families that are living in the suburbs. So I had to really learn the language and really try to figure out a lot of things of my own. And the city of Sao Paulo was really a lot of Italian immigrants went there in the past, and so it had an effect on the language. So in Rio, a lot of Portuguese descent, descendants were living there, and it, has, and it affects the language as well. So going to Rio was something mind-blowing because it's such a beautiful place, but the first thing I noticed were the favelas. And the favelas are places where people were living and live that are usually coming from the north of Brazil or people in poverty, and, and that's the only place that they can live, and they ended up building entire communities. But a lot of them were living in the favelas in these hills, and then they would come down for work, and then go back to the favela. And the thing that's so crazy is that this is probably, I think it's the largest favela in, in the southern hemisphere of the world. Um, it's massive, and I don't know if any of you have seen City of God, but that's one of the favelas in, in Rio, but there's, others that are even bigger, um, they're impenetrable. You know, a lot of times there is a lot of police that are trying to go in to get certain suspects or drug dealers, and it's impossible because they don't know the streets, they don't know the roads, they're all, only if you live there you would know. So it's, it's impossible to go there. And this is something that I, I you know, it's shocking when you see, but it's, it's massive. And, Actually, the best view of the Christ Redeemer statue is from the favela. So that's the best view that you'll have, and they have that view, but you see it way in the corner over there. <laughs> but it's something that's mind-blowing, and uh, the difference between Rio and Sao Paulo, each place, there are favelas all over Brazil, but this one is the biggest in Rio, and this has kind of like shook me uh, to see for the first time. And then you have the beauty of being there, which was just captivating. So I could see it in different parts of the city. And we had the opportunity to, to film a, a commercial for a festival, which is called Rock and Rio. And it was one of the biggest festivals they've ever had. It started in the 80s um, with Queen and, and Nina Hagen, and all these different artists back then that never had played there before. And it, James Taylor, I mean, it was massive and it became the biggest festival to them because it was the first opening since they had a military dictatorship and so it was one of the, the first festivals. So we were able to record and do a video there in this area and these are the views that I had from being there and it was, I, I love that place even though it has a lot of crazy things going on. And again, I was talking about carnival and, and samba. I always was thinking Rio is the place but then we ended up doing a trip to the north of Brazil and in Bahia. 
And Bahia is an incredible place because each part of Brazil is kind of broken up into almost maybe countries, it seems. Everything changes. And so this has more of a, a vibe of, of just complete chaos at times. But this is during Carnival there. And I had already been in Carnival in Rio. I was like, oh, man, this is insane. But when I got there, this is a, a, on a whole nother level. And this was, we're on a truck that's actually playing music. And you're playing live music on top of this truck or bus for six, seven hours while people dance behind you nonstop. And so we had the opportunity to do that, being like the first like rock band to do that. Because normally it's samba. And people are like, yeah. Then we had, we had the chance to do this with our music, like me screaming at samba people. And there were metal people behind them like, yes, yes, finally, it's happening, like rock. And so it, it was intense. I, I didn't know what I was really getting into. And I didn't, I mean, the mass amount of people there, it's intense. So I took this photo from the Trio Electrica, it's called. And, you, and, and it's just everyone smashed in together. And it was terrifying at times because I, I looked down at one point and I saw there was an argument going on and I see somebody with like a knife and then just like yelling at people to like, yo, oh, that guy. And there's, it's, everything is just out of control and chaos, but it's, it's something that happens every year, all the time. And so Carnival Rio, any, Carnival outside of Rio, Carnival anywhere, it's just really became a different image for me. Like it's something I was like, I like it, I got to see it once and I'm good, you know, but <laughs> after that, I mean, that's the reality of it. You know, a lot of people go there, a lot of tourists come for that, but it's, you know, it's, it's for real. There's some definite beauty behind it, but this is the reality that I was seeing behind it. It's just, which is intense. Um, when you go to the north of Brazil, it's usually, it's the poorest part of Brazil, unfortunately. A lot of the money that was supposed to go there for the infrastructure of, of Brazil um, wasn't, it didn't go there. The money didn't arrive. There's a lot of uh, corruption that goes on. So unfortunately, even though the northeast of Brazil, the northern part of Brazil is the most beautiful, closest to the equator, the best weather, incredible vegetation, incredible history, um, it's still the poorest. And a lot of those people end up coming to Rio or Sao Paulo for work. And since there isn't work, they end up living in a favela. It's like a horrible cycle. But I ended up going to the north of Brazil many times, and I always found it to be my favorite place to go. But there was always just insane things happening. And this was on a way to, like, um, Hisifi, an area there. And it was an accident on the road with all this food that just started spilling out. And then you just have people from the, from the village, like, walking around, just gathering up the food and just taking it. So this was something that happened in the moment of just passing, and uh, it was intense. Sorry. <laughs> Siri is acting up. Okay. So, and that whole area was completely new to me again, and, and this is where a lot of uh, African descendants ended up being in the north part of Brazil. You can see it, it's 80% black in the north of Brazil as well, and so it's a big difference from the south of Brazil, which is a predominantly a lot of Europeans ended up going there, German, Dutch. And so the north for me was really intriguing just because we would stay at these hotels and they would be on the water somewhere. And then I ended up getting like a, a long lens to take photos. And I started to take these photos from very far away and from hotel rooms. So I just decided to take a series of photos from each hotel I'm going to, I'm gonna take a photo outside the window what's happening. And there was always something crazy happening in the north of Brazil. And so this was one of the photos with the long lens that was just happening outside the, the window. And I just thought it was bizarre, <laughs> to say the least. But at the same time, beautiful. You know, people just really enjoying themselves, being themselves, and unaware of anything that's happening, you know. And again, from the hotel room, I just, I didn't understand what was happening, why there were like pigs chasing this girl, or why she was out there, why we were staying at this hotel. But um, <laughs> it was just again like, let me just take a walk over to the, oh my God, oh my God. And this split seconds of just being in the north of Brazil where 
anything can be happening. Again, another scene. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's beautiful in a way because people are very free even though they don't have a lot. There's still like this togetherness there where everyone's smiling. You, it's easy to talk to people. You walk, you meet people, and it kind of reminded me of how people are here, very nice and friendly, in a very genuine way. So in a way, I felt very comfortable there, even though there's a lot going on, a lot of things I really didn't understand. But the more I started to learn the language, I started to really appreciate a lot. And so then you have like these places that a lot of Brazilians don't go to. This is an example. It was this beach. It was completely deserted. And I was like, why, why don't Brazilians come to these places? And they're like, they're just so influenced by America. And the outside, they end up going to Disney, spending a lot more money. And they just don't really, it's hard for them to really know the interior of their own country, which is, I found, uh, kind of sad in a way. But talking to all the Brazilians that I met, you know, they were really like, I, I want to start going to these places, you know, after seeing a lot of the photos that I was taking and exploring. But I just thought it was fascinating, something I didn't know about it, Brazil as well, and being there, that all these places are really empty. You know, it's unfortunate. And they also have, like, different places in Brazil that are very weird things, like we have something in New Mexico, New Mexico where people think there's aliens and things like that. They kind of have the same thing here in this city where they felt that aliens had came down and UFOs. So everything is around UFOs and aliens. And there was a massive UFO <laughs> in the middle of the town. I just thought it was bizarre because there's the, the countryside, the interior. And they're like, oh, yeah, aliens definitely come there a lot. And they were very serious about it. So that was, a, again, another like intricate, weird part of Brazil, all the diversity. Um, there's a lot of uh, people really into rock, and, and really, which I didn't know either. And so this was something that was interesting. Like, parents are always dressing their kids up in outfits and taking them to shows, and it's a family event. So that's why the name, I understood a little bit more why Sepultura had grown, because people had grown up with it. They started very young with their parents teaching them. And the band is, in two years, it will have 40-year history. And I've been in the band for 23 years. So I, I started to really understand from playing these shows in the interior of Brazil, just running, you know, kids just passing by and just throwing me, like, these signs and then, like, walking away. And that's what basically what happened, these two... Uh, I think sisters, yeah. <laughs> but it was just really the moment. It's like one of my favorite photos because their parents are just like, didn't tell them to do anything. They just saw me and they looked up and were like, rock on. <laughs> Very serious. So then I started to really take an interest in portraits of people. But I didn't want them to really be posing. So this is definitely a walk by in the city of Belo Horizonte where the band is from and it's a market. And it's just a guy passing by that I just took a photo. I didn't, I didn't know him, I didn't talk to him once. But uh, it definitely reminds of a lot of the problems that they have going on with the people being on the street. But there was just something I started to really get into portraits and, and faces. And this one really struck me. Um, there's a lot of kids on the street in, in Brazil, and this is an area called Parachi. It's a beautiful place, but a lot of times you, you get used to a lot of the kids on the street. You start to know them and see them grow up, actually. And it's sad because there's no education, there's no school really for them, but they get passed all the time. And again, I, I just started to take more photos of this just to let people know, like, to stop passing them by in a way, you know, is something that still hits me every time there. And also having a son, you know, I started to realize, you know, this hit me even harder. And so that diversity, again, like this is going back to being invited to certain places, you know, it's like ridiculous amount of wealth, you know, that's going on there as well, you know, with all the poverty. So this was a house that I would go to for lunch every now and then I would get invited. And actually in the background is a gallery on the property where they lived with art, a full art gallery that the person had. And he had two semi-trucks filled 
with different art that he would put in rotation every now and then to change out the art to show friends or people that were coming by there. And he had an entire history of his family being there and a, a coffee book explaining the history of his family and how he discovered this house as a kid, ended up buying it and designing this whole area with this gallery there, house in another area. It was, I, I'd never seen anything like it. It was a compound. And so I would go there and I met his son actually who spoke perfect English at a party and he, he was like, hey, you wanna come to my dad's house? <laughs> and this was the house. <laughs> so, and ended up like, where I ended up becoming better friends with his, his father and his stepmom. And his stepmom uh, ended up being Barbara Leary. I don't know if you know Timothy Leary, but it was his, his wife. So it was a really, I started to meet a lot of very interesting people and uh, they'd have very interesting parties. And I brought my sister here actually um, because they know a lot about art and everything, but it was, I, I thought she would get a kick out of seeing this place. And, um, but it just felt very strange, you know, like going to this place, it's in Sao Paulo, but it felt like another country. You know, they search under your car and your trunk. Um, when you're going in there, you have people who are like the CEO that I met from Ford Motors of South America lives there, or there's people, uh, the Guinness family from Guinness Beer, like all these different people I meet at the parties there who are really nice and everything, but it was just a weird sense of going there. I had one friend that was leaving a party from here, and once you get out, she had two gunmen come and, and started, you know, get out of the car. And for some silly reason, she tried driving away, um, and they ended up like shooting at her car um, just outside this, you know. So. You just really don't know what can possibly happen. I mean, there were other stories of people I know that, um, again, with the, my friend Eduardo, who was in the tank, he was, his whole family were taken hostage in their house on the holidays where these guys dressed up as cops and went to their house and then they had them hostage there and they're asking about safe and things like that. So at this, all this beauty at the same time was very, very, very real. So I, I started to really wake up immediately, you know, just like, okay, anything can happen. Um, there's so many positives and there's definitely negatives, but I have to really be careful living here. And so, I, I don't know, I think it was almost in a way better to be naive, but I started to really learn a lot about what to do and not to do. And, and, and just, it was fascinating for me because, um, I just never imagined that these things were really going on, but they happened there. Um, another thing that was really pressing is the fact that the, the indigenous people in, in Brazil, and so this disconnect that they have from the big city, a lot of people have never been to the Amazon, even if you're Brazilian, just because it's so far away. And Brazil is a massive country, it's almost the size of the US. And a lot of people don't really go to the Amazon because it's, it's massive, it's very dense, and it's a, like being on another planet. You know, it's people there, they live a completely different life, they go by the way of nature there because it's, because they're forced to. So there's a lot of problems that they have going on with politics and everything, and I always felt that they don't really get heard there, uh, the indigenous people, and, and it felt like they're always blocked or in jail or in a way like dying quickly um, because there's no laws out there in the Amazon. There's no way to, to regulate. There's no law enforcement to go into the Amazon, the money that's put there to stop all these farmers and agricultural people from just taking over certain land. So it's a big problem that I think a lot of people are starting to wake up but it was something that was, again, in my face, I was like, wow, what, what's going on with, you know, with the indigenous? And they're like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> and so we ended up writing that in the music. It became an influence to write songs about that. And we ended up doing an entire video. Um, the band itself became really well known because incorporating music with the indigenous people, going to the Amazon, recording uh, music and, and songs, people had no idea what was going on there, even Brazilians. So that was something that was very influential and something I would always see, but never, I had to make that connection myself. Um, 
there's areas of, of downtown Sao Paulo, which I was staying a lot, and it reminded me of New York and the crack epidemic. And that's what's going on there, like the 80s New York crack epidemic, but everywhere. So they have these streets where all these people on the street are doing crack 24 hours a day. This is just one street. So it used to be one big area. Then they split it up into certain areas all throughout the downtown area. And they call it Crack Lundia, like a Crack Holland. And the police are on the end of each of the street and they just kind of maintain some type of peace there. But it's terrifying and, and chaos. And, but at the same time, in the day, there'll be people there coming to feed them. And so right now, this is the daytime. I was always passing by, and you'll see there's a police officer on the end there, the car here, and people come and they get fed. But it's, it's a weird cycle that's happening. They haven't figured out what they're gonna do. But it's again, like something that's just, it just reminded me of 80s New York and just kind of like, uh, walking like zombies is the only way to kind of describe it in the middle of the night. And they have people sitting in the middle of the night on the street in chairs. And I was asking the taxi driver, I was like, Why, who's that just sitting there in the chair? And he was like, think about the people that live here. You know, there's people that live here, so they have to go to the store. They got to go somewhere. So these people sitting in the chair will walk and make sure that they get to their apartment or the store safely and back. And so... It was intense, you know, a lot of the people in the bubble don't realize this is going on in their own city. And that's why I wanted to really get to know all of Brazil, not just where I was situated, you know, where going to like crazy dinner parties and stuff. But I just, I like to stay here and, and every Brazilian be like, you're, you're crazy, you know, you're out of your mind. But I started to really know a lot of the people working in the area, you know, people who weren't on crack, people who were just working there, just wanted to have a regular life. And so they start to, now they're having a lot of uh, police that are ruling the area downtown that are doing um, kind of mandatory checkpoints, which if you're driving or motor boys that are driving by that they're checking people. And, and the police there, they don't get paid a lot. And, and of course there's always good and bad, but it's, it's disturbing because I've been pulled over there many a times um, just being in a taxi and they, would think that maybe I robbed the taxi because I'm, I'm black and they're not used to seeing black people taking taxis. So that was, they would come out with their guns, shaking, you know, it's just terrifying, like, oh, you know, hands up. And it's just like, uh, I'm a gringo, you know, <laughs> I'm an American, like, take it easy, you know. But I always felt a, a real uneasiness with the police there. And, and they're just, it's tense. So they have these different roadblocks during the day and night. They've actually stopped people from drinking and driving because that was something that was like everybody was doing when I moved there. And it was terrifying. It was like, oh, yeah, here's a beer. Here's a six-pack. No, it's good. It's good. And that lawlessness, they had to put an end to that. So now people are definitely like, I'm not driving anywhere. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to get drunk here. And you definitely see that change. But they're trying to change the area and it's gonna take a lot because it's still people don't feel that safe there. And it was, you know, every day I would just see them on the street, checkpoint, and at one point I saw one, a police officer's kid, you know, that was there imitating the cops. He had like a little vest on, like a little toy gun, walking around at the checkpoint. And I was like, God, oh, this, is, this is too much. Um, and you see that there's, consistent construction that's happening. The old is still there, which is kind of interesting and beautiful that they build around it, but it's, it's impossible to stop. There's just an overpopulation of people, a lot of people still coming to the city looking for work just because they're not, there's no possibilities in the north of Brazil, which is incredible, like I was saying before. Um, they're very much into the Ramones. <laughs> <laughs> which I found out later, it's probably one of the biggest bands in Brazil, which was fascinating. And also 70% of the people are vaccinated. And it's a different perspective of being vaccinated there. And when I went there after the, the whole pandemic and 
I was like, what's going on here? And they're like, yeah, a lot of people die because things happened at the very beginning. It was very the same political situation going on in the U.S. But a lot of people get vaccinated there because it's been a history of getting vaccines there, and they would die if they didn't get the vaccine. So they know that it to be good, you know, that it's something that's always helped them. So they were struggling. They didn't have enough. Um, and so some people were coming to the U.S. if they could to get the vaccine. So you have a lot of people there that are definitely wearing masks, which I, I it was surprising. I, I Everyone is very disciplined, and um, a majority of the people, they have this vaccine culture. So it was, you know, after being here and the argument going back and forth, there was just a relief to be there. It's like, yeah, I got a vaccine, whatever. Moving on, there's other important things. Um, again, there's just incredible murals that are all over the city that they're finally letting these artists do. Um, and, they, and they have a deep appreciation for it, you know? People love this, and I think it's something that makes it not so much of a concrete jungle, but I, I love their appreciation for art, musicians, and you see this everywhere, which is really incredible. In the downtown area, again, it's just everywhere you go, in, incredible murals, each artist having their own style, and I think they're starting to understand that this is something very unique that they have. And I've always loved that about being there and meeting these artists and the fact that they're international now and all over there. So Brazil for me was, you know, it's always a learning experience and it's definitely a lot of things that I, I never imagined were going on there. And I'm always still learning. So once I realized I was like in this band and we're going to all these different places, we were really able to push for going to places that are extremely exotic and, um, and a lot of people relate it to the band because they're coming from Brazil and they're like, oh, it's a third world country and we can relate to it. So we had an opportunity to, to play India. And again, I was like, I, don't, I can't imagine being in India where there's metalheads or people into rock in India. And I was very naive for the fact that, of course, they're exactly like they are here, but Indian. You know, they have an Iron Maiden shirt or a black shirt, and they're into the same thing, which was beautiful, because I started to realize that this, there's a connector with music, no matter the religion or the race or anything like that. There's this connection that's something that really united the band with all these different cultures and places. So we had this opportunity to go to India. We didn't know any bands that really had gone there. Um, the offer was good. It seemed okay. We, it was taking a chance, because... We had no idea, but we were up for the adventure. And so getting there, we started to see these billboards. And I was like, oh my God, they really went all out. You know, I thought there'd be like a, a flyer or something, but they were like, no, we, we spared no expense to make this happen, you know, and they were very serious about it. And so for me, I had a big idea of what India was like because I started, I became a vegetarian because of reading a lot of books and trying it out. Um, like, let's try this lifestyle. And it's because of the Hindu religion and India and reading all these books at a really young age. And getting there was completely the biggest shock I ever had. I'd never been to a place where I had culture shock. And so my camera was out a lot here because every second I turned my head, there was something happening. And on the plane, it, they made it seem like this is a new India, you know, very relaxed and nothing crazy happening, and it's going to be an incredible time. Enjoy. And then I get there, and, and it's, you know, literally the opposite. <laughs> it was, I, I didn't, you know, as soon as I stepped off the plane, it was the smell, the sights, every sense that I had in my body was hit all at once. And I, and I just felt, you know, like I feel so small, and I, something's going to happen bad. And uh, I just, it took me a few days to get my head around it, but once I came out of the shock, I started to really enjoy it, and there were a lot of things that I wanted to see. So just getting under the idea of a billion people uh, in a country, it's a lot of people, and I already was coming from Sao Paulo, and I was like, ah, but it, it's not going to be that much different. It was very different, you know, a billion people. So there were advertisements, like even driving on the countryside. I was like, well, how much money did they spend on this? This is in the middle of nowhere. And it was... It, it was fascinating that, you know, it's like a, a B 
beer company that was kind of like sponsoring it, and not many people drink there. So it was just, I don't know, it was just trying to get my head around it, but I was just taking it kind of all in, like, okay, we're in India, and we're just going to leave it up to them. Um, I loved everything about it just because there was just, like, funny moments, you know? It just goes slow. I mean, there was nothing going slow. There were elephants in the street, you know, like gangs and monkeys robbing stores and just like, it was insanity. And I'm not over exaggerating. It was literally that going on. It was just like, oh, my, how is this even functioning? But it was many, many years, thousands of years of history and religion and spirituality going on that you could feel. But uh, it was intense. There was always like to so many things that were just like people like on top of, of being able to just like, there's four people on one motorcycle here. And it was just like, and I'm in the van in her glasses taking the photo if you look in there. And I was, and they're just casually, she's just like, yeah, I'm on the back of this bike with all my kids, no helmet. He has the helmet, but, <laughs> but everybody else doesn't and that's okay. Um, so just shocking all the time. Um, I knew a lot of the stories of, of what was happening with like baby Krishna and everything like that. So I was like, okay, this is the India that I'm thinking about. But then there was like a side that was like a Catholic side as well. Like I didn't realize there were so many different religions that were happening within India. And this was something that, that was fascinating to me and I didn't know. So there were a lot of Catholic schools as well and kids dressed up in Catholic uniforms just waiting. But all these kids were completely fascinated by, by me. Um, just they had never seen anybody. I had really long dreadlocks, and I'm a big guy there. So for them, they were just like all the time, a lot of kids always just fascinated. But they have a big street culture of kids on the street there, kind of like Brazil, but on a, in a different way, because these kids could speak different languages in order to eat. And they would be roaming the street as like, kind of like a gang, a family that they would go out and they would all try to earn money. And so they were able to speak in different languages and it was nonstop. But it was in a way that the people we were with, they're like, do not give anybody any money. And I was like, but it's a kid, you know, he's just asking for a little money. And my guitarist was like, made the mistake, like, here, take this little girl and boom, it's like non-stop, like just like 50, 60 kids all with their hands out screaming like in different languages and just trying to speak to you, just trying to get money. I never felt that desperation before in my life. I'd never seen that before in my life. And it was something, it was, it, it took me aback. And I was like, oh my God. And they were like, we got to get in the van, get in the van, get in the van, you know, the people we're with. And, but it was something that, Every second you turn, there were kids there dressed up, trying, you know, entertaining, trying to, to make that money. And it, and it was everywhere in traffic. And, but, I mean, they seemed like they had, like, this type of family unit on the street just to survive. And, but there was something, I don't know, I, I, a beauty to them, you know, their ability to, to survive and to speak and... I mean, we'd be like, oh, I don't speak Hindi. We'd be like, oh, I speak English. It's like, oh, I speak Portuguese. I speak Spanish. You know, they could speak all these different languages to survive. And it was, it was difficult because they were very charming. And then it was just like, I'd never seen poverty like this. So there was this insane scenes of people, kids. I would see bodies, um, people just defecating in the street or bodies being carried over somewhere. And, and it, it was shocking to me. It was, I mean, I can't, I can't lie, you know. But after being there, we played three shows in New Delhi, Mumbai, and a place called Shilong, which is in the Far East. And that's mostly Catholic religion going on over there. Um, it was intense, you know. And, and kids, they were just always looking and wanting to take photos with me. So it was really weird, like they'd be yelling out of the bus or like pointing like, oh my God, and just kind of getting the photo, like take a photo, take a photo, like get a photo with me and him and I'd just be standing there and they'd be all around like, yeah, like they had no idea what I did, but it was just like everywhere, like buses. And this was like one of the moments where I'm in the van and they're just like 
out the window, just crazy. And they were always just super ecstatic, like, yes, somebody different from another place. As you can see, these are uh, these kids are completely different, but they still are like throwing up like signs. And this old guy in the background is like, what is going on here? <laughs> what is going on? But so lovely, you know, like so inviting, so happy, even though it was chaos going on most of the time. Um, I started to get into taking portraits there a lot more because people weren't really aware of the camera. And that was fascinating to me. So it became interesting to get people in their element just doing what they do, day-to-day -day stuff, like really just oblivious to the camera. And I, I, I thought it was just so fascinating to, to be able to take photos like this with people that are just kind of there, but, you know, I, I didn't ask him to pose or anything. I just saw him, and he just stood there, and I took the photo, and he was just like, all right, see you later. <laughs> no conversation at all, but I love the faces. I love the eyes, and uh, we, we traveled. Sometimes we were taking a, a bus, and the whole thing was like, let's go to the Taj Mahal. Like, everybody has to go to the Taj Mahal. So this was like a road trip to the the Taj Mahal, and and that that was just insane. Again, like just seeing so many diversity of people on this road trip to the Taj Mahal, and this is at like a truck stop there, and this is kind of mo it's like disturbing, but uh, he would make this monkey do tricks, and then you would give them money for the trick that the monkey is doing. But uh, I, I always hated this, but it just looked like the monkey was just like, you know, enough. Like, he's almost like, but uh, I don't know. I, I, it was just really bothered me. And then they also had cobras everywhere. And I was like, oh, man, there's another stereotype thing that is actually coming to life. <laughs> it was just like a guy with a flute, and there's a cobra, like, dancing. And I was like, it's really dancing. So it's like... It was really moving, and I was literally very far away from this. I was on the bus. <laughs> There's no way I would be outside of that bus. But this was like a typical truck stop there. You know, I was just, I thought it was in insane. You know, I'd never seen cobras dancing. Um, but this is a little bit of the chaos, like, going to the Taj Mahal, where it just felt insane. And you can see there's some monkeys up here on the power lines. They had just like robbed these stores down here. And I wasn't joking when I was saying they're robbing stores. They have like a whole system of grabbing food. One's distracting, the other one's taking, and then they leave. And they've just been around people so much that they know how to do these certain tricks. But it's just, it's just so much going on all at once where it's hard to get my mind around it. And uh, there's always this camaraderie with, with men. I would never see men with women like embraced or walking hand in hand, never. It was always guys, always guys hand in hand or walking hand in hand. And then this is just a little bit of outside the Taj Mahal, and I was like, great. We're going to see the Taj Mahal, and this is a preview of what we're going to, you know, this is not at all what I was imagining. And, um, you know, I just felt, like, again, so insignificant because there was just so much going on and, um all at once. And so once getting to the Taj Mahal, it's like this is kind of like a hallway leading up to it. And it, I could feel like this energy level being built up as I walk through the tunnel and you're with everyone else and you start to feel this energy coming through. And it doesn't look real. And when you're looking through the tunnel, it's like it looks like a mirage. And I was talking to the people that were giving us the guide who were doing the whole tour with us. And they're like, look, a lot of the buildings in India are built specifically for energy and spirit and everything like that. And this was designed specifically to have that effect on you, you know. And so I, I was feeling it, you know. I mean, through this tunnel, it was like everything started to lift up. And it was just, it was fascinating just to, to really be a part of that. Because you could feel the energy off of other people being excited being there. Um, but it was completely the opposite of what was happening outside. Everything was like completely catered. You had to wear booties at the Taj Mahal when you come through. So it's exactly, I think, the way that it was when they first built it. It is, I mean, spotless. 
I mean, it is unbelievable. I have never seen a structure like this in my entire life. And uh, it was mind blowing. It was, I, honestly, it was, I've never seen anything like it. And the fact that outside of the Taj Mahal is a complete swamp and just incomplete, it's really, really bad. And I was trying to really understand how is this able to stand? It's like a really swampy area. I don't understand. So they explained like the construction of it and how the bottom of the Taj Mahal, the, the king who decided to have this built, decided to get this type of wood that over years, once it gets wet, it becomes harder. And, the, and so with that, the base of the Taj Mahal has always been getting stronger throughout the years. And so every aspect of this was thought of because this king was, in the end, really horrible. I heard all these romantic stories about the Taj Mahal. This is for his ex-wife. It's like a, you know, and, but it's coming from a different side from people who are Hindu are like, no. They're like, there are a lot of slaves that were brought to bring all this stuff here. They didn't want to do it. They did it anyway. And then once they were done, he started cutting off tongues and gouging eyes of people who worked it because he didn't want anyone else to repeat or show or to that how this was made. He wanted this structure to be the most unique structure that was ever built in the world and forever. And so then he heard all those people and they had a completely different view of it. Hindu people, they're like, this place sucks, you know? And, and I was like, I get it, I get it. So you see on top, they have a crescent moon, but it's, um, it's like a trident. So they had to do that to kind of appease, appease the people there um, because it's a trident is a symbol for the Hindu religion and then the crescent moon for Islam. So they had to do that on purpose there, but it doesn't bring a lot of great memories after hearing that whole story. I was like, this is the most beautiful place in the world. And they're like, yeah, people suffered like hell here. And I was like, oh, all right, I have a different view now. Um, but it still doesn't change the fact of really just how unique it is, because I've never seen anything like that. And for Indians, it's, it's free to go there. Um, only tourists have to pay. So this was something that was, you know, I wasn't expecting to see or be a part of, you know, metal, being in India, playing there, uh, having this experience. And again, there were just always, I'd never see girls with guys, always guys, even though homosexuality or anything like that was never like it's condoned there. But there's always guys like together. It doesn't mean that they're, they're gay or anything. It's just the fact that it, this embracing of like men together was always something I just never imagined that I would see there. It was just something very unique. Again, there's a lot of things going on. In the East, we played this place I was talking about called Shilong, and at the airports there, nobody could go in the airport unless you had an actual plane ticket because they were afraid of terrorists. And so um, it was very strict, and it was an area that I, I just knew nothing about. And we got out of the airport, and there's all these people waiting there, and they're like, we're going to take you on this trip, and we're going to have to split everybody up, and there's going to be six cars, and we're going to go to the city where you're going to play. But there's always a lot of accidents, and we can't take a helicopter there because there's even more helicopter accidents. So here we go. And it was literally not really a road. It was just kind of like dirt with rocks thrown in it. And I would just see these scenes like all the time. I was like, I don't think we should be here. I don't know if this is a good idea. But um, this is some of the scenes that I would see. So there's terrorist attacks. There are certain things happening. And, um, and then there's people like military there, like having problems with their vehicles. And there was this a, a really bizarre situation to be thrown. And I was like, do they really want to have music? You know, like let alone the metal music from Brazil. So again, there was a whole change. You know, I stopped seeing all the really the Hindu religion that started to become more Christianity in that part of the, the country, which I never knew about. And there were trucks with Jesus everywhere and, and, and Catholic school. But again, I started getting into taking photos of the actual people and what was going on. Um, it was just fascinating because I would always be looking and be like, oh, there's one person. Wait, there's two, there's three, there's four in the back. And I just love the the faces of, of people there in India. It was just something very refreshing and new. So this is a town, again, with our advertisement. It was just like 
the town barely had lights. It was a bamboo stage. Um, it was, it was like, you know, it was something like an Indiana Jones movie or something. Like at night, it was completely pitch black, and there were just people just sitting kind of on the side of the road, like hanging out in the middle of the night. And uh, it was just really a bizarre scene, but one of the best places to go because everywhere I turned, there were just like things like, wow, that's, that's really, really, really bizarre. Um, Again, all the kids, they love the fact that we were there. They're just like, we don't know what you're doing, but this is cool. And they're all going to Catholic school and all dressed up. And, and you see the mother and completely not at all what I was expecting to see, but it's just like everybody in the morning going about their way and then going to Catholic school. <laughs> Cows in the street, that's for real. <laughs> because they're very sacred, so they're everywhere. And again, all the women's saris are beautiful colors. Like, all, even if you're homeless, they were, for somehow they were always clean. And that was always, like, fascinating to me, just, like, really vibrant and bright and really incredible colors. So this is something that I, I loved about it and, and the fact that people were really into cricket there. And I know nothing about cricket, but I just thought, you know, I, again, moving and passing by quickly, I was able to just capture a little bit of the people there and, and, and the motion, and I just love the way that this, this guy's body and his movement and everything, I just thought it was something incredible that I was able to capture in the moment that was happening all around. So everywhere I was just like, what's going on here? Why is this guy in the middle of this? Why is, what's going, you know, so many questions, but I just decided, like, I'm just going to take photos of all the stuff that I felt was completely out of the ordinary. And so, again, now making these movements to like these type of places, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. We ended up going to Russia, and Russia was like, I'm picking the places that had like a really big impact on me, and Russia was a place that I knew really not too much about, and it's always been kind of the enemy of the US, but we had done so many tours there, we ended up taking the Trans-Siberian Express across Russia to do shows. We did everything. So getting there, you know, this is the one thing I wanted to see, you know, I was like, oh my God, this is Russia, this is, this is incredible. And I was again fooling around with the film camera, doing double exposure in Red Square, but it's freezing cold. Um, but just really becoming more comfortable and taking photos and just really wanting to explore Russia. And, I just thought it was very romantic at times. You know, there are certain places like Red Square, um, completely unimaginable. And then I see this. And I was like, wow, wait a minute. I just saw like the most incredible things and now I'm seeing this? And then I was like, this is Russia. Like, welcome. And so these guys are like, you could not take picture, not at all. And I was like, all right. And, th and then I did take the picture. But I just felt so bad for this monkey. I was like, why? It's freezing cold, and this monkey is in boots <laughs> at Red Square with a leash. And then that's when it started to sink in. There's a hawk, like eagle, and then another baby monkey there. And, and then Russia started to really settle in on me, like, OK, <laughs> anything can happen here. <laughs> like, and it is happening. Um, but the, so, so anyway, we we have to, in order to get to certain places that we're playing, we had to take the train and I, some of the sites are what I would see the pollution cause there's no regulation of laws of anything of any of the factories. So a winter tundra environment is not at all like Dr. Shivago or like what I was imagining crazy pipes outside of people's houses, like People live like, this is something that just stays there. It's not like there for construction. It's like, this is an everyday thing. So, I mean, it was really much worse than, I mean, it was really bad. Like, I didn't imagine that it would be that insane in certain places. But then, the extreme, you know, being in St. Petersburg and just having beautiful, beautiful buildings and architecture uh, was radically different. And, and the fact that I... I figured out that there in custom, I was smiling at everyone and everyone just kept telling me, stop smiling, stop smiling. 
you can't smile here. It's like, that's not something that we do. And if you're smiling, it means that something, you're going to trick somebody into something bad happening. So it's completely opposite there. So you, no smiles. And that was usually most of the people there were just no smiles. Um, so again, this is another great place that I really love taking portraits of people because they, they, there's no emotion at all. It's just like not aware of the camera. Again, the winter tundra it was like kind of flying over. It was like this is going over Siberia. And I heard so much about Siberia and I was just like, wow, it's a really terrifying. At the same time, it's like craziness going on. There's still like this fashion for style, no matter what. <laughs> You know, like, it doesn't matter. The condition could be in Siberia, which this was. It'll be, like, heels in snow. It was, I was, it was fascinating. Like, it didn't matter. Um, and again, this is just, like, Siberia. But then going through the middle of Russia, I realized that it's a really diverse place with a lot of different cultures, a lot of different religions, a lot of different people. And there were certain things I never realized existed there. So we're able to see a lot of things um, in Kazan. This place in, in Russia was really incredible, you know, and there's nobody there. It was at night, it was just kind of walking around us and being able to have that freedom to do that there. So the train, not at all what I was expecting. I was like, this is the train and we're gonna go first class. And they're laughing at our names because they don't know how to pronounce it. And it's only women that really work the trains that are on the trains and they don't speak any English, but they're very hardcore to get you know on the train and get off the train immediately. And they're yelling most of the time. But I thought this was great because they were finally smiling. And we're like, yes, we made them laugh. And they're looking at our tickets and, th and this was our first class train. So you have the bottom area and then you sleep up top. And these are my bass player and our technician and we're some people are on the train for three days, two days, just traveling and looking out at the winter tundra and pollution. These are the Russian guys in their cart. So these guys, they take everything with them. From the dressing room, they pick up everything, bring all the food, they don't leave anything to waste. So their cart is filled with everything from the shows that we played and they always were, everywhere they would go, they would take everything, no waste. And that's when I realized, like, wow, there's a lot of places in the world that we're playing, like here in Cuba, you would forget a water. They'd be like, here's your water that you left in the van the other day. And it's just like, they don't have fresh water, you know, in certain places. You know, they, they don't let anything go to waste. You know, majority of the places we were going, Russia, India, majority of the people, it's poor. And so most of the places I started to realize, like, man, the majority of the world is extremely, extremely poor. And so on the train, going to the dining cart that nobody was there because everyone brings their own food on the train and it's too expensive for them. It just felt like a time warp and going back in time and then just kind of walking my way through and people just doing their thing, like cooking food, being out, sleeping, feet out. And the kids were just flipping on me. They're like, why is there a large black man walking through this train in Siberia? And, uh, and they had that expression on their face, like, what is happening? But not in a negative way. They're in a way like, just questions, like, are you a fighter? And I'm like, no, I'm way too old. You're doing sports. And, and just, they could barely speak a little English, but they wanted to try, and they were just fascinated. But they were cracking me up. We were just giving them all their, like, food from the dressing room, like potato chips and stuff, and they were just loving it. But they were nonstop with questions about football because they were like, oh, Brazil, football, so you're playing football, and yes, and football, oh. But this was just like third class, like kind of like walking through, and, and they had been there for days, you know. Uh, sometimes the when the train would stop, I would just be like, okay, we're in Siberia. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm not getting off at all just to get some air because they don't let you open the windows on the train. So this is just kind of like a site of like the middle of Siberia, just like some rabbit dog kind of there, but he was very chill. <laughs> um, and there's always people at certain borders and stuff that I felt I love to photograph, like take photos of the actual portrait again of a woman selling everything at the border. Again, Russian face is just, I don't know, so much expression to it, but they don't care about the camera. It's like, I'm, I'm not pointing it directly in their face, but 
I would love taking portraits of, of people there. And I kind of cracking a smile with this guy getting off the train, but there was a moment like going to a hotel and I realized I'm very a uh, different person there in the middle of Siberia when I go to the hotel and I'm checking in and there's a guy across the hotel and he's just yelling, Africa, Africa. And I was just like looking around, I was like, what is he yelling Africa about? And, and he comes up and he's like, yes, Africa, we will go have a drink downstairs and we will do this. And I was like, ah, okay, you don't have many black people here at all. And he's like, no, no Africa. Like, he just associated, you know, black. He's like, he's African, you know, and not in a harmful way. And I was like, no, I'm not going to have a drink. And the next day, the Ukrainian guy working with us comes with a pen. It's like Africa. <laughs> and I was like, you guys have a great sense of humor here. And, uh, but I'll never forget that. Um, it's just like not what it seems. And, uh, and so a lot of people, like I would be taking photos, just kind of watching in traffic, spending a lot of time on tour, and then just, huh, taking series of photos, like, interesting, now I know what, he's, he doesn't have a leg. I was like, oh, he's asking for money for that. So a lot of times we just end up spinning in traffic. This, again, Siberia, very strange. I walk into the bathroom there, and I was, like, wondering, why are these cushions over the head, like the urinals? So people would get so drunk that they would rest their head there while they're <laughs> using the bathroom. And I was like, this guy has got to be so rich. He's a genius. Like, I've never seen that. Completely unexpected in Siberia. Something really weird. I didn't know anything about the Japanese Russo, Russo War. And so we had gone all the way to the far end of Russia where you could almost see Japan from this mountaintop. And there was these weird statues of these kind of like subservient Japanese uh, structures that were kind of there. And I was like, this is weird, you know? And it was an island that we were playing that they were fighting over and it ended up being like a Soviet prison island, but it used to belong to Japan before the war. So I don't know. I just felt it was just kind of weird seeing these like subservient like Japanese statues there. Um, a lot of ice fishing, just like kind of throwing you back in time like traveling through there, but it, it was beautiful to see just the scenery there and, and people just kind of in their natural element and the building of Siberia as well where there was a lot of construction and things going on where they really wanted to I think it's really evolving, but again, it's one of the most poorest places I've ever seen. And this is from the mountaintop of this island, being able, you can almost see Japan, but it's like just workhouses, kind of. It, they found oil there, so a lot of the people are, don't get any of the money, and then the rest are just companies, like a lot of oil companies there. And then at the airport, leaving, there's just like, I definitely know it's in Siberia when they have like wolves you know, selling wolves in the airport, um, wolf skins, which was just part of, you know, the culture there, I guess. I don't know, but it was just, I was just taking the photos, and I was like, this is disturbing. Um, and then one of the one things that we had to do, it has n not necessarily so much to do with Russia, but we were very close to Ukraine, and this is a bus from uh, Chernobyl. And they were telling me, like, hey, you have a chance to go on this Chernobyl trip. And I was like, is it really safe there? Like, I don't know, you're letting people go there? And like, yes, it's very safe. You, we have these, we'll take you on a full tour. And so this is one of the buses they use for evacuation. Like, and then one of the first things they show us is like, this is the Red Forest. This is the most contaminated place in the world. And I was just like, why are we here? You know, it's just like, we don't have to be here long. It was already too late, and they give you, like, a Geiger counter that's clicking like crazy. He's like, see, it is very, very high levels of radiation here still. And, like, after many years, and it, it was uh, terrifying, um, to say the least. But, um, yeah, so that Jeez, okay. Uh oh. <laughs> but uh, going there really, it was before actually the movie that came out, Chernobyl, and um, it, it was intense. It was really like everything, that movie itself was very real. I was really surprised by a lot of the facts that they got down, but 
It was, a, at first I thought it was like, kind of like, ah, oh, we're going to go to Chernobyl, this is crazy. But then it became really, really sad in a way, just because you get to see, you know, how it's still contaminated and how crazy it really is, uh, still to this day. And they're still working on it. Um, all these different scientists from around the world um, trying to prevent this mass going into the earth. It's still like seeping into the earth. Um, it's it's really insane. I saw where the actual uh, meltdown happened, and um, you know, hopefully they'll be able to to figure out some solution there. But I I just really wanted to thank everybody here for for coming out and and uh, listening to some of these stories. Um, you know, I have to thank my sister for really making this happen. Um, and again, you know, a lot of this wouldn't have happened if, it, you know, being able to take these photos and having that uh, that chance if it wasn't for playing music and, and starting that music from Cleveland, starting in the basement and then getting all the way to Chernobyl. And so, <laughs> and so um, you know, I'm really thankful that and grateful that we've been able to have like these journeys that continue onwards. And again, it's been 81 different countries, you know, from here to even places like Mongolia and Kazakhstan and, um, but again, that unifier is music and it's something that's so beautiful and all those places we had incredible time, um, incredible people and stayed, you know, kept those contacts um, and it's great learning from those people from the actual culture. So I wanna thank you all for, you know, being here at this moment and uh, listening to all this. <laughs> If you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Any questions at all, just... We do have a mic here so we can get it on record. Don't be shy. Begin again. Begin again. <laughs> I'm sure the people are going crazy from that. So are these photos going to be on display either here or somewhere else? This was a fascinating talk. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for coming out. The stories are great. The images of both beauty and mystery and poverty, um, you know, remind us of our combined humanity and how we need to be on a lookout for, for each other. Mm -hmm. And you're a tremendous storyteller, and this should be shared with a group larger than just us. So I'm wondering if these images are gonna be available. I definitely plan on doing something bigger and uh, different photos, different areas uh, of the world, but I would love to, you know, I just given the opportunity to do it and put something together would be great is what I'm thinking. And also a book as well, so um, that's definitely, you know, something that we'll figure out. <laughs> Um, is there a story about the most kind of random, irreverent, very small world where you crossed paths with someone while you're out on one of these adventures <laughs> that you knew that you're like, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, some of these places, it's fascinating that there's Brazilians there, like in Siberia. You know, I'll see like somebody in the crowd, and they'll be waving a flag from the hometown of where Sepultura is from. I'm like, I can't believe. You know, there is a Brazilian here in Siberia, like with a football jersey, like, yeah, freaking out. But it's usually like that because Brazilians are fanatical for Sepultura. You know, it's, again, like one of the biggest bands in Latin America, which I realized, you know, playing all around there and, and just the history alone, it's just in people's blood. So a lot of times you'll see them everywhere. It could be Kazakhstan, you know, there was somebody like, yes, I'm Brazilian or you know, the island of, uh, like, Cyprus, you know, there's a guy from their hometown, so a lot. You know, I'm never surprised anymore. It's, the world is getting so small. <laughs> Ciao. Because this is dynamic. <laughs> this is just outstanding. I love it. The uh, it's great to see you here. This is just beautiful, and like they were saying, the way you weave the story, <laughs> helping people, helping each other, I mean, just 
seeing that because we all go around not seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's right around us. So I love it. Oh, thank you so much. Begin again. <laughs> <laughs> this is more for other people's entertainment than my own because I know the story. Right. But um, I think about the story you tell about the American Express ads, and I think about um, Lost in Translation with Bill Murray. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your funny little campaign <laughs> that yeah. was in all over the airport? Oh uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, it, it, it's funny because when I moved to Brazil, it was a big change. When I left the US, I was living in Amsterdam for two years, and then I was, we started to write a new album, and they were like, you need to come to Brazil, you need to come here because we're gonna work on the album, it'll be easier. I was like, okay, I'll move to Brazil. And it was intense, and then after a while, I got used to everyone coming up, and then it went from doing autographs with everyone to photos with everyone, with everyone getting cameras over time. Um, and then people start to recognize me. They're like, that is so cool, you're American, you're living in Sao Paulo on purpose. You know, and they're like, you're, you're, you're here, and you're learning Portuguese. And then I had the opportunity where they came to me from MasterCard Black, it was, and they were just like, hey, can you do an ad for us? And I was like, all right, what is that? And they're like, no, it's for all South America, and we're gonna build an airport, and you're gonna be like, we're gonna do digital, we're gonna do photos, and, and it was just like, just me, though. And it wasn't like the band, so it was really different world living there. And it was weird after 20 years being there that I was looking forward to being back in the States just for the fact of not being recognized because it became a daily thing of leaving the house. It's like, yo, Sepultura, eh, eh, hogging hole, oh my God. But it's like everyone. It could be aunt, uncle, grandmother, kids. Like, oh, now that I'm older, like my mom loves your band or my grandpa is a big fan. It's like, oh my God, it's been that long. But um, it was in every like billboard and ad and everywhere that they had this MasterCard um, ad and it was like a funny commercial where people are like, oh my God, Derek Green, and like smiling like, <laughs> and then we take a photo and that's the ad. And But um, it was something I wasn't expecting, you know, because like I was saying, like I was only thinking, like, oh, it's a metal only rock band, but it's much bigger than, than that there. You know, the band is much bigger than I think those guys imagine. Um, I'm sure they're surprised that it even continued on after the singer left. But it became something else, a whole different generation of people loving the music, loving what we were doing. Um, and those different things can happen there, you know, uh, where we were able to actually not only do like MasterCard and stuff, but like Pepsi. And um, we did an ad which was for, not Mercedes, but uh, Volkswagen. And they had an idea like, you're gonna sing in Portuguese, but it's gonna be like a classic song where you're talking about coconuts and you guys, so the idea is like you're gonna have a whole show with people in front and you're gonna be like, here we go, one, two, three, and then you're gonna start singing like, you know, the coconut on the beach is so lovely. Like weird, funny, and it was like a big success there. Where they're like, oh, this is so funny. We thought you were gonna play Sepultura and then you're singing about coconuts on the beach. It's amazing. So a lot of, Great things come from being there. It became like a real home. Um, it's just, you know, it's a different life there. You know, like I said, it's weird to, to walk out there and at customs are just like, yeah, oh shit, like, oh my God. Like, they're like, can we take a photo? And they're not supposed to be taking photos. I mean, my visa going there, you always needed a visa to go there. And they're just like, they weren't even paying attention. Like a lot of times I was like, ah, I forgot. And they're like, ah, all right, it's okay. just. Next time, remember, you know, get that visa taken care of. And, and just like things like that, I was like, wow, they really don't care. And I mean, but they were just such, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, being a part of that history. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. Thank Wipe you to Derek. Up.